Hello and welcome everyone, Ragnarok Total War here with a brand new series in Rome 2. We are going to be playing the Rise of the Republic DLC and we're going to be reading Polybius, the Rise of the Roman Empire as we go through this. So I want to get back to the channel roots and get back to the philosophy and the historical type stuff. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to play through this and then I'm going to add the read through of the book over over my gameplay. So I'm not going to be talking about the gameplay uh, very much at all. Uh, maybe a little bit at the beginning and maybe a little bit at the end. Of the uh, of each part for the series, but the bulk of the each episode, we're going to be reading uh, this historical book because I've been thinking a lot about this, and I've got this huge library here of, of books, and I'd really like to share that with you guys. So I, I want to add this stuff to the let's plays, and yeah, just get back to the channel roots. Um, if you guys want to discuss. Uh, some of this philosophy and history on uh, the streams. Um, you're more than welcome to join me for the streams and we can discuss it there. But for these Let's Plays, uh, it's going to be almost like an audiobook with Total War content in the background. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy. I hope um, you don't, you aren't too harsh on my, uh, or too critical on my pronunciations of the words because a lot of the pronunciations are going to be really, really bad. Uh, but before I get started with that, I just want to mention that the version of Polybius's work, The Rise of the Roman Empire, that I'm working from is a translation by Ian Scott Kilvert. Uh, now, usually when I do these uh, read-throughs, I, I get into a bit of the introduction of the that the uh, translator has written. But I don't think we're going to do that for this one. Maybe at the end, if there's time, we can potentially do that. But we're just going to stick to Polybius's uh, writings strictly uh, for this, at least starting off. And um, it, this is a Penguin Classic uh, that was published in 1979. All right. Yeah, so um, before I start reading that... Uh, I'm going to read through this stuff, and I, I just want to mention for you guys, I mean, it might make it a little bit more difficult to follow along with the campaign, but, I mean, if you're watching closely to the campaign, then, you know, the game itself is going to tell you what's happening, and I, I don't know, I feel like, you know, anyone who's familiar with the Total War games uh, will be able to follow along with too, without too much difficulty. And um, I, I do want to mention one last thing, too, is that um, I haven't played this campaign uh, myself. And, um, you know, it, it's going to be a, a more difficult campaign, especially for, for Rome, too. Uh, Rome is a little bit uh, a little bit of a tougher playthrough, uh, is my understanding of this one. So it should be a lot of fun. should uh, test my skills a little bit, but I probably will be going... Uh, a little bit slow because of that so that'll help you guys follow along a little bit as well but I will read all of this introductory stuff here for you guys as well um, before we start reading Polybius just to give a little bit of context from the total war histori historians so central Italy has always been a land of warmth and generous fertility. Uh, fertility. Over the centuries, many tribes have become fascinated by its lush valleys, green forests, and abundant natural resources. The first Indo-European peoples arrived here in prehistoric times, and with ingenuity and independent spirit, some managed to grow into larger entities with their own political and economic significance. Among them, were the Greek-influenced Etruscans and Samnites, who were the dominant Italic civilizations before the rise of the Romans. However, right now they dominate the region as best of friends and worst of enemies. 
All right. A hundred years have passed since the expulsion of the last king from Rome, herald herald heralding the birth of the Roman Republic. It has been a glorious transformation that has changed the Roman state profoundly. It has it's also been a time of scarcity and hardship. Throughout this time, the newly born Republic's territory has remained unchanged, encompass encompassing limited areas around the city and along the Tiberius tiny sleeve of land reaching the shore. Now times are changing and prosperity once again returns. Rome's ambitions will be quenched by nothing less than glory, prominence, and supremacy over all other peoples. In their path by the sophisticated Etruscans to the north, the hordes of barbarian Gauls to the southeast, and the Latins and mountain tribes to the south, Rome's task is both difficult and perilous, but the task of her rival her rivals is impossible and doomed to failure. And we get written knowledge plus 10% research rate. Not bad. Destined for greatness minus 50% resistance to foreign occupation. So that'll help out with public order as we push through this. Uh, government action periodically organized elections for consuls or a dictator. And Capitoline Hill fortification. Two battles are required for the city of Rome to fall. So that's actually... Uh, very, very interesting. So we've uh, got a double assault on Roma itself. All right, so to start this up. We will watch the cinematic, and as soon as the cinematic finishes, we'll uh, get right into some Polybius. We failed you. Accused you and banished you. And you prayed for the gods to punish us. So they inspired our enemies. Sent savages. They took our land, sieged our city to slaughter husbands, wives, and children. The city you loved. But we are destined to be the world. Marcus Furious Camillus. Rome needs you. Rome is at war. The Etruscans of Veii have been our enemies for many years, and since peace is out of the question, we must bring them down by force of arms. The proud Volsci of Latium are carefully observing the conflict, and will undoubtedly strike should we provoke their ire. In such a conflict, we might try to ally with the Hernici. Meanwhile, rumor has it that a new threat is stirring beyond the lands of the cowardly Sabines and docile Umbri. Be mindful, yet brave. May Mars watch over you. My sword is yours. You'll soon have the enemy on the run. Book One Introduction If earlier chroniclers of human affairs had failed to bear witness in praise of history, Be welcome. might perhaps 
have if I been can give necessary you a fair for answer, me to urge you all readers it. to seek out and pay special attention no. to writings such as these. My for certainly, and the mankind good of our people, possesses no better guide to conduct in the state than the knowledge of the past. But in truth, all These historians, with without exception, one may now say, let us to table. have made this claim for a feast the be-all and end-all of their work, namely, Welcome, that the study friend. of history is at I once an education in the truest sense your... and training for a political career, and that the your most infallible, indeed, the only method of learning how to bear with dignity the vicissitudes of the fortune to is to be reminded of the disasters me. suffered by others. You have your deal. We may agree, then, that nobody at this time need feel himself obliged to repeat what has been so often and so eloquently stated by other writers. Least of all does this apply to my own case. For here it is precisely the element of the unexpected, in the events I have chosen to describe, which will challenge and stimulate everyone alike, both young and old, to study my systematic history. There can surely be nobody so petty or so apathetic in his outlook that he has no desire to discover by what means and under what system of government the Romans succeeded in less than 53 years in bringing under their rule almost the whole of the inhabited world, an achievement which is without parallel in human history. Or, from the opposite point of view, can there be anyone so completely absorbed in other subjects of contemplation or study that he could find any task more important than to acquire this knowledge. The arresting character of my subject and the general spectacle which it presents can best be illustrated if we consider the most celebrated empires of the past, which have provided historians with their principal themes and set them beside the dominion of Rome. Those which qualify for such a comparison are the following. The Persians, for a certain period of period, exercised their rule and supremacy over a vast territory, but every time that they ventured to pass beyond the limits of Asia, they endangered the security not only of their empire, but of their own existence. The Lacedaemonians, after contending for many years for the leadership of Greece, at last achieved it, but were only able to hold it unchallenged for a bare twelve years. The rule of the Macedonians in Europe extended only from the lands bordering the Adriatic to the Danube, which would appear to be no more than a small fraction of the continent. Later, by overthrowing the Persian Empire, they also became the rulers of Asia. But. Although they were then regarded as having some become the masters of a larger number of states and territories than any other people before them, they still left the greater part of the inhabited world in the hands of others. They did not even once attempt to dispute the possession of Sicily, Sardinia, or Africa, and the most warlike tribes of Western Europe were to speak the plain truth unknown to them. The Romans, on the other hand, had brought not just mere portions, but almost the whole of the world under their rule, and have left an empire which surpasses any that exists today or is likely to succeed it. In the course of this work, I shall explain more clear clearly how the supremacy was acquired, and it will also become apparent what great advantages those who are fond of learning and enjoy from the study of serious history. The starting point for my history will be the 140th Olympiad, and the events with which it begins are these. In Greece, the so-called Social War, the first which was waged by Philip of Macedon, son of Demetrius and father of Perseus, in alliance with the Achaeans against the Aetolians, in Asia, the war for the possession of Suol, Syria, uh, Syria uh, fought between Antiochus and Ptolemy Philopater. And in Italy, Africa, and the neighboring countries, the war between Rome and Carthage, which most historians call the Hannibalic War. These events immediately follow those which are recorded at the end of the history 
of Aratus of Sicyon. Now, in earlier times, the world's history had consisted, so to speak, of a series of unrelated episodes, the origins and results of each being as widely separated as their localities. But from this point onwards, history becomes an organic whole. The affairs of Italy and of Africa are connected with those of Asia and Greece, and all events bear a relationship and co contribute to a single end. This then is the reason why I have chosen that specific date as the starting point for my work. For it was after their victory over the Carthaginians in the Hannibalic War that the Romans came to believe that the principal and most important step in their efforts to achieve a universal do dominion had been taken, and were thereby encouraged to stretch out their hands for the first time to grasp the rest, and to cross with an army into Greece and the lands of Asia. Now if we Greeks were familiar with these two states which disputed the rule of the world, there would perhaps have been no need for me to write of their previous history, or to explain what purpose impelled them, or upon what resources they relied in embarking upon such an immense undertaking. But the truth is that most of the Greeks know little of the former power or the history either of Rome or of Carthage. And so I believed it necessary to prefix this and the succeeding book to the main body of my work. I was anxious that nobody, once he had become engrossed in the narrative proper, should find himself at a loss and have, it, have to ask what the Romans had in mind, and what were the forces at their disposal when they ventured upon that enterprise which finally made them the masters by land of our part of the world. On the contrary, I intended that these two books and the introduction they contain should leave my readers in no doubt that the Romans had from the outset sufficient reason to entertain the design of creating a world empire and sufficient resources to accomplish their purpose. Now, my history possesses a certain distinctive quality which is related to the extraordinary spirit of the times in which we live, and it is this, just as fortune has steered almost all the affairs of the world in one direction and forced them to converge upon one and the same goal. So it is the task of the historian to present to his readers under one synoptical view the process by which she has accomplished this general design. It was this phenomenon above all which originally attracted my attention and encouraged me to undertake my task. The second reason was that nobody else among our contemporaries has set out to write a general history. Certainly, if they had done so, I should have had far less incentive to make the attempt myself. But as it is, I noticed that while various historians deal with isolated wars and certain of the subjects connected with them, nobody, so far as I am aware, has made Welcome, any effort to guest. examine the general and comprehensive scheme of events Enter, when it began, once it originated, and how it produced no. the final result. Last, I therefore the thought it imperative been... not to overlook or allow to pass into oblivion this phenomenon, the achievement of fortune, which is the most excellent and profitable to contemplate. For although fortune is forever producing something new and forever enacting a drama in the lives of men, yet she has we never before in a single instance created such a composition or put on such a your showpiece as that which we have witnessed in our own times. It is impossible for us to achieve this comprehensive view from those histories which record isolated events. One might as well try to obtain an impression of the shape, arrangement, and order of the whole world by visiting each of its most famous cities in turn or looking at a separate at separate plans of them, an approach which is not in the least likely to yield the right result. It has always seemed to me that those who believe they can obtain a just and well-proportioned view of history as a whole by reading separate and specialized reports of events are behaving like a man who, when he has examined the dissected, part, dissected parts of a body which once alive and beautiful, imagines that he has beheld the living animal in all its grace and movement. 
But if anyone could reconstruct the creature there and then, restoring both its shape and its beauty as a living being and show it to the same man, I believe he would immediately admit that his conception was nowhere near the truth and was more like something experienced in a dream. The fact is that we can obtain no more than an impression of a whole from a part, but certainly neither a thorough knowledge nor an accurate, accurate understanding. We must conclude then that specialized studies or monographs contribute very little to our grasp of the whole and our conviction of its truth. On the contrary, it is only by combining and comparing the various parts of the whole with one another and noting their resemblances and their differences that we shall arrive at a comprehensive view and thus encompass both the practical benefits and the pleasures that the reading of history affords. In this book, I shall take as my starting point the first occasion on which the Romans crossed the sea from Italy. This event occurs at the point where Timus leave, history leaves off, namely in the 129th Olympia. It will therefore he be my task to describe first of all how and at what date the Romans established themselves in Italy and what considerations impelled them to cross to Sicily, which was the first country beyond the shores of Italy on which they set foot. The actual cause of their crossing must be stated without comment, for if I were to pursue the cause of, of the cause, I should fail to establish either the starting point or the fundamental principle of my history. The starting point, then, must be a fixed moment which is agreed and recognized by all, and can be clearly identified from events, even though this may require me to retrace my steps for a short period and summarize the intermediate happenings. Or if the facts on which the commencement of history is based are known or are open to dispute, it will be impossible to win approval or credibility of, for what follows. But once the reader's agreement has been secured on that point, the rest of the narrative will be readily accepted. The date I have chosen then to mark the beginning of the establishment of Roman power in Italy follows in the 19th year after the naval battle of Agasopotimi and the 16th before the Battle of Luc Lucretra. In the same year, the Spartans ratified the so-called Peace of Antilicids uh, with the King of Persia, Dinosius the Elder. Tyrant of Syracuse defeated the Italian Greeks at the river Eleparus and laid siege to the Regium. And the Gauls captured Rome by storm and were occupying the whole city except for the capital. However, the Romans were able to negotiate a peace on terms which were acceptable to the Gauls. So when they found themselves, contrary to all their expectations, once more in possession of their native land, they began from that moment to enlarge it. In the years that followed, they waged a succession of wars against their neighbors. Through their martial valor and their consistent successes in the field, they subdued all the Latin tribes. After this, they fought the Etruscans, then the Celts, and then the Samnites, whose frontiers bordered the territory of the Latins to the east and to the north. Some years later, the Tarentines insulted a delegation from Rome and the then, sake of taking the fright at the con no. consequences of their action, they appealed Welcome, to the help friend. of King Paris of I Epirus. Trust you bring this happened in the year before the invasion of Greece by the Gauls, we some are, of whom perished at Delphi, while others crossed into Asia Minor. The Romans had I already, as I have mentioned, not... subdued the Etruscans and the Samnites and defeated the Speak Italian Celts obey. in many battles. They now for the first time made war upon the rest of Italy, not as if its inhabitants were foreigners, but rather as if their country were already rightfully their own. The trials of strength they had already experienced with the Samnites and the Celts had made the Romans veritable champions in the art of war. They showed great courage in withstanding the invasion of Perius, and after 
they had finally driven him and his army out of Italy, they continued to fight and subdue those who had taken his side. They succeeded, contrary to expectation, in overcoming all these advers uh, advers adversaries. adversaries. <laughs> and when at length they had subjected all the peoples of Italy except for the Celts, they laid siege to the city of Regium which was at the mo that moment in the hands of a number of Roman citizens. I must explain that the two cities of Messina and Regium, which face each other across the Sicilian Straits, had suffered a peculiar but similar fate. A contingent of companion mercenaries in the service of Agathocles had for some time cast greedy eyes upon the wealth and beauty of the city of Messina. And shortly before the events I have just described, they had seized their opportunity and captured the place by treachery. They insinuated themselves into the city under the guise of friendship and then at once took possession of it. They followed up this action by expelling some of the citizens, massacring others, and taking prisoner the wives and families of their dis dispossessed victims, each man keeping those whom he happened have found at the moment of the outrage. Lastly, they divided among themselves the ownership of the land and all the remaining property. Once they had so quickly and so easily appropriated such a fine city and its adjoining territory, others were quick to imitate them. When King Paris soon afterwards crossed over from Italy to Sic Sicily, the people of Regium believed they were threatened by a double danger. It was not only an attack by Perius that they feared, but also an invasion by the Carthaginians who controlled the sea. And so they appealed to, to Rome to support them and to send a garrison. The force which the Romans dispatched numbered 4,000. It was commanded by one Decius, a native of Campania, and for a time his troops carried out their undertaking of protecting the city. But in the end, they were tempted to follow the example of the Mamertines. They became envious of the beautiful situation of Regium and of its inhabitants' prosperity and private wealth. And having made the mercenaries their accomplices, they broke their word to the people of Regium. They expelled and massacred the citizens and took possession of the place, just as the Mamertines had done at Messina. In Rome, the people were outraged at their compatriots' action, but at that moment they were powerless to prevent it, because they were too deeply involved in other wars which I have mentioned. But as soon as they were free to act, they surrendered the city and laid siege to it, as I have related above. When Regium fell, most of the garrison were killed in the assault, during which they defended themselves de desperately, since they knew the fate that was in store for them. But more than 300 were captured. These prisoners were sent to Rome. The consuls had them all marched into the forum. And there, according to the Roman custom, they were first scourged and then beheaded. The object of inflicting this punishment was to restore so far as possible the good name of Rome among the allies. The city and the territory of Regium were immediately restored to the inhabitants. All this while the Mamertines, so long as they could count on the alliance of the Romans and of the companions who had seized Regium, not, not only remained in undisturbed possession of the city and territory of Messana, but also harassed the Carthaginians and the Syracusians in the neighboring territories, and levied tribute from many parts of Sicily. But when the outlawed Roman garrison in Regium was closely besieged by their compatriots, the Mamertines lost this support and were quickly compelled in their turn to take refuge within their city from the Syracusians. This happened as follows. Not long before, the Syracusian armed forces had fallen out with the civil authority. The troops were at that time stationed near Mergen, and they elected two commanders from their own ranks. One of these was Artemidor Artemidorus and the other Hero, who later became the ruler of Syracuse. Hero 
was still quite a young man, but he was well fitted by natural character for some kind of royal position and political authority. Having taken, having taken over the command, he used some of his family connections to gain entry to the city. Once inside, he quickly got the upper hand over his opponents, but proceeded to administer affairs with such tolerance and generosity that the Syracusians unanimously acclaimed him as their general, even though they were by no means well disposed towards leaders chosen by the army. However, from the very first measures that he introduced, it immediate, immediately became clear to all intelligent observers that his ambitions extended beyond the position of general. Hero had observe, observed that the dispatch of the Syracusian army on an expedition under the command of the Supreme Magistrates invariably resulted in quarrels among the leaders and the outbreak of revolutionary activity of some kind. He also knew that of all his fellow Syracusians, it was certain that Leptines, who commanded most supporters and the highest prestige, and was particularly popular with the masses. He therefore made a family alliance with Leptines by marrying his daughter, so that whenever he had to go away on active service, he could count on leaving Leptines behind as the guardian of his interests at home. Meanwhile, he had come to the conclusion that the veteran mercenaries were an unreliable and potentially mutinous element in the army. He therefore led them out against the city of Messana, ostensibly to attack the companions who had seized it. He pitched camp against the enemy near Centur Centurpa and drew up his troops near the river Chiamosaurus. His battle order was so arranged that the infantry and cavalry which consisted of Syracusian citizens were grouped under his personal command and held in reserve as if he intended them to attack from another quarter. The mercenaries, on the other hand, were ordered to make an advance in which he allowed them to be cut to pieces by the companions. While they were, while they were being routed, he retired and withdrew safely with the Syracusians to the capital. Then, when he had effectively achieved his person, a purpose and rid the army of its unruly and seditious elements, he proceeded to enroll a considerable considerable body of mercenaries whom he picked himself and therefore continued in secure control of affairs. Before long he noticed that the Mamertines as a result of their success were acting in a reckless and overbearing manner so he proceeded to arm his citizen levies and put them through a hard period of training. Then he led his, out his troops, engaged the enemy there the river Longanus in the plain of Millet, defeated their army and decisively captured their leaders. This action put an end to the Mamertines' aggressive conduct, and when Hero returned to Syracuse, he was saluted by all the allies as king. Thus, the Mamertines, after losing the support they had enjoyed from Regium, as I have mentioned above, next suffered a crushing defeat on their own territory for the reasons that I have described. At this point, some of them turned to the Carthaginians and offered to put themselves and the citadel in, the hands, in their hands, while another party sent a delegation to Rome to appeal for help as companions and so as kindred people, and they likewise proposed to surrender the city. For a long while the Romans could not make up their minds, since it was all too clear that to give the help required would be thoroughly inconsistent. Only a little while before, the Romans had inflicted the death penalty on a number of their fellow citizens because they had broken faith with the people of Regium. To try now to help the Mamertines who had committed an identical offense would be an act of injustice and that would be very hard to defend. The Romans saw this clearly enough, but they saw too that the Carthaginians had brought not only Africa, but also large parts of Spain under their rule, and that they were the masters of all the islands of the Sardinian and 
Tyrrhenian seas. If the Carthaginians gained control of Sicily, it would prove the most vexatious and dangerous of neighbors, since it would encircle Italy on every side and threaten every part of the country. And this was a prospect which the Romans dreaded. It seemed clear that this would be the fate of Sicily unless help were given to the Mamertines, for the Carthaginians had already subdued the greater part of the island, and once Messana had fallen into their hands, it would not be long before they brought Syracuse under the dom domination as well. For the well. sake of friendship that has been, the Romans foresaw all these possibilities and considered it imperative that they should not abandon Messana, so we must refuse. and thus allowed the Carthaginians to secure a bridgehead for the invasion of Italy, and so they debated the question at length. The First Punic War Even after long consideration, the Senate did not approve the proposal to send help to Messana. They took the view that any advantage which would, would result from relieving the place would be counterbalanced by the inconsistency, inconsistency of such an action. However, the people who had suffered grievously from the wars that had just ended and were in dire need of rehabilitation of every kind were inclined to listen to the consuls. These men, besides stressing the national advantages I have already mentioned which Rome could secure if she intervened, also dwelt on the great gains which would clearly accrue if every individual citizen from the spoils of war. And so a resolution in favor of sending help was carried. And march. When this decree had been passed by the people, one of the consuls, Papias Claudius, was appointed to command the expedition, and was given orders to cross to Messana. After this, the Mamertines, partly through threats and partly by spreading false information, contrived to persuade the Carthaginian commander who had previously established himself in the citadel to move out. They then invited Appius to enter and handed the city over to him. The Carthaginians crucified their general for what they regarded as his cowardice and lack of judgment in leaving the citadel. They then stationed their fleet near Cape Pelorius and used their land forces to press the siege vigorously from the direction of Sunis. At this point, it seemed to Hero that the moment had come for the barbarians who had occupied Messana to be driven out of Sicily once and for all, and so he formed an alliance with, with the Carthaginians, marched out of Syracuse, and advanced upon Messana. He pitched his camp near the mountain of Chalcidicus, Chalcidicus, on the opposite side of the Carthaginian lines and so cut off his route of escape from the city as well. Meanwhile, Appius, the Roman consul, the performed force. the dangerous operation of crossing the straits by night and making his way into Messana, but he found that the enemy were pressing the siege vigorously from all sides, and since, since he considered it both dangerous and humiliating for him to be encircled in this way, with the enemy in control equally of the sea and the land, he tried to come to terms with the Syracusians and the Carthaginians in the hope of taking the Mamertines out of the war. Both sides ignored, to his, ignored his proposals, however, and at length he decided out of sheer necessity that he must risk a battle and that he would attack the Syracusians first. So he led out his troops and drew them up in battle order, whereupon Hero eagerly followed suit and engaged him. There was a long and hard-fought struggle, but in the end, Appius gained the upper hand and drove the whole of the opposing army back to their camp, after which he stripped the enemy's dead and returned to Masada. To Hiero, this action gave a foreboding as to how the whole campaign was likely to end, and so he disengaged his troops under cover of darkness and, retri and retired with all speed to Syracuse. The next day, Appius was greatly encouraged when he learned of the outcome of the battle, and he decided to attack the Carthi Carthaginians without delay. He ordered his troops to stand to 
at an early hour and at first light led them out to battle. He engaged the enemy, killed large numbers of their troops, and forced the rest to retreat in disorder to the towns in the vicinity. These successes enabled him to raise the siege at Messina and then to move over to the offensive, ravaging the territory of the Syracusians and their allies and scouring the country without meeting any resistance. Finally, he turned the tables by encamping before Syracuse and laying siege to the city. This then was the first occasion in which the Romans crossed the sea with an army. And it was for these reasons and in this, uh, the context which I have described that they did so. It seemed to me Battle that this course. was the most suitable point of departure for my whole Point's narrative. And so it is upon these episodes that I have based my main theme. Though I also went some way further back in summarizing the course We're of events. Out. So that in my exposition of the general causes there should we be no matters serve. left in doubt. We will serve you. For those who desire a complete and comprehensive account of the development of Rome's present supremacy, it is vitally important, I believe, to trace this earlier phase of her history. In other words, they must acquaint themselves with the period and with the process whereby the Romans began to advance towards better fortunes after the defeat they had suffered on their own soil and with the details of how and we when, after serve. becoming the masters of Italy, they applied you. themselves to the conquest of countries further Speaking afield. We obey. On the My market. readers should not Fire therefore be surprised march. if in the course of this work, Forward, I sometimes digress to explain ahead. some of the earlier history of the most famous states. I shall do this to give them a starting point and thus enable them to understand the origins and the circumstances from which each of these states reached its present position. In other words, I shall use the same approach as I have adopted for the Romans. After these explanations, it is time to present my main theme. But first of all, I must summarize the episodes which are dealt with in these introductory books. To mention these in order, we come first to the events of the war which was fought between Rome and Carthage for the possession of Sicily. There follows the war in Africa, and after that the achievements of the Carthaginians in Spain, first under Hamil Hamilcar and later under Hasdrubal. The latter campaigns coincide with the first incursion by the Romans into Illyria and, the region, and that region of Europe, which was shortly followed by their struggles within Italy against the Celts. At the same time, the war named after Cleomenes, the king of Sparta, Barta, is being fought in Greece, and with this I shall conclude my general introduction in the second volume of my history. There is no need for me to relate all these developments in detail, nor would this be useful to my readers. My plan does not require me to record them in full, but merely to refer to them in passing by way of introduction but to those events which form my principal theme. I shall therefore do no more than recapitulate them briefly in order so as to make the end of the introduction fit into the beginning of my history proper. In this way my narrative will follow an uninterrupted sequence, and it will be seen that I have good reason to touch upon certain matters even though others have already recorded them. At the same time this arrangement will make the approach to later events intelligible and easy to follow for the student of history. I shall, however, try to give a rather fuller account of the first war which was fought between Rome and Carthage for the possession of Sicily. This is because it would be difficult to find any contest which was longer in its dur duration, more intensively prepared for on both sides, or more unremittingly pursued once begun or one which involved more battles or more decisive changes of fortune. The two states concerned were still at that time uncorrupted in their customs and institutions. Both received no more than moderate help from fortune, and both were equal in strength. In consequence, we can form a more accurate picture of the national qualities and resources of each by comparing their conduct in this war 
than in any subsequent, subsequent one. There was also another reason, no less influential than those I have already mentioned, which persuaded me to pay special attention to this war, namely the fact that Philinus and Fabius, the historians who are reputed to be the most expert authorities on it, have failed, in my opinion, to report the truth as they should have done. Now, if we may judge by the lives and principles of these men, I do not suggest that they deliberately set out to mislead their readers. In other, in the, on the other hand, both seem to me to have behaved in the way that men do when they are in love. Italian Thus, cavalry. because of his partisan zeal and his persistent devotion to one side, Belenus insists that the Carthaginians acted with wisdom, virtue, and cur courage on every occasion, and that the Romans behaved in the contrary fashion, while Fabius gives us a, a diametrically opposite version. Now, in other spheres of, spheres of human life, we should perhaps not rule out such partiality. A good man ought to love his friends and his country, and should share both their hatreds and their loyalties. But once a man takes up the role of the historian, he must discard all considerations of this kind. He will often have to speak well of his enemies and even award them with the highest praise should their actions demand this, and on the other hand criticize and find fault with his friends, however close they may be if their errors of conduct show that this is his duty. For just as a living creature, if it is deprived of its eyesight, is rendered completely helpless, so if history is deprived of the truth, we are left with nothing but an idle, unprofitable tale. We must therefore not shrink from accusing our friends or praising our enemies, nor need we be afraid of praising or blaming the same people at different times, since it is impossible that men who are engaged in public affairs should always be in the right, and unlikely that they should always be in the wrong. We must therefore detach ourselves from the actors in our story, and apply to them only such statements and judgments as their conduct deserves. The truth of what I have just said is borne out by an example from one of these histories. At the beginning of his second book, Belenus tells us that the Carthaginians and Syracusians made war against Messana and laid siege to the city, that the Romans then arrived by sea, entered the town, and properly made a sortie to attack the Syracusians, but that, after suffering heavy losses in the fighting, they fell back upon Messana. Next, they marched out against the Carthaginians and were not only repulsed but lost a large number of men who were taken prisoner. This is Philinus's account, but he then goes on to say that after the battle, Hero, the ruler of Syracuse, completely lost his head, that he not only set fire to his camp and his tents and hurried back to Syracuse the same night, but also abandoned all the forts which had been built to threaten the territory of Masada. In the same way, he reports that the Carthaginians, after their battle, immediately evacuated their entrenchments, dispersed among the various towns of the neighborhood, and made no attempt to contest the possession of the open country. He further tells us that the Carthaginian commanders, recognizing that their troops had become demoralized, decided not to put matters to the test of battle, and that the Romans, following on their heels, ravaged both Carthaginian and Syracusian territory and proceeded to lay siege to Syracuse. This account, it seems to me, is a mass of inconsistencies and does not need to be examined in detail. The same troops whom Philinus describes at the outset of besieging Masada and as successful in all their operations are seen a little later as retreating in headlong rout, abandoning the open country, and finally as having become demoralized and encircled in their turn. On the other hand, the men whom he represents as defeated and beleaguered are suddenly reported as having broken out, pursued their em enemies, taken control of the open country, and finally placed Syracuse under siege. It is impossible to reconcile the two versions of events, so it follows that either his account of the earlier 
or else of the latter operations must be false. It is the former which is inaccurate. The Syracusians, Syracusians and the Carthaginians actually did abandon the open country and the Romans imme immediately began to make war on Syracuse. And as he says on Echtela II, a town which lies between Syracusian and Carthaginian territory, we must therefore admit that the first part of Philinus's report is false and that this historian represents the Romans as having been defeated in the fighting in front of Masada, whereas in, the, in fact they had been victorious. With which we shall find that this fault is repeated throughout Philinus's history, and the case is similar in that of Fabius, as I shall show when the occasion arises. At any rate, I have made my point in respect of this digression, and shall now return to the matter in hand, and do my utmost to give a true picture of this war, taking a short road and confining my narrative strictly to the order of events. When the news of victories won by Appius and his legions reached Rome, the people elected Manius Attaculus and Manius Valerius as consuls and dispatched the whole of their armed forces both these generals to Sicily. The Romans possess four legions in all which consist of full citizens as distinct from the units provided by the allies. Each of these legions is enrolled annually and comprises 4,000 infantry and 300 cavalry. When these troops arrived in Sicily, most of the cities rose against the Carthaginians and Syracusians and came over to the Romans. Hero, took note of the mood of terror and dismay which had seized the Sicilians and when he contrasted this with the numbers and strength of the Roman forces he concluded that the Romans prospects were far brighter than those of the Carthaginians. So since his region urged him to take the side of the Romans he sent messengers to the consuls with a view of concluding peace and a pact of friendship with them. The Romans responded readily to his proposals especially in view of the problem of provisioning themselves. For since the Carthaginians commanded the sea, they were afraid of being cut off on all sides from their essential supplies. They remembered that the troops which had crossed to Sicily before had suffered badly from such shortages. They judged that Hero would do them great service in this respect, and so they welcomed his offer of friendship. A treaty was then drawn up according to the conditions in which the king undertook to hand over his prisoners to the Romans, without a ransom and, in addition, to pay them 100 talents of silver. When these terms had been agreed, the Romans henceforth treated the Syracusians as friends and allies. For his part, Hero, once he had placed himself under the protection of the Romans, kept them provided at all times with their essential supplies, and for the rest of his life he reigned securely over the Syracusians, treating the Greeks with such consideration that he earned crowns and many other honors from them. He may fairly be regarded as one of the most outstanding of rulers, and as the one who enjoyed for the longest time the fruits of his own wisdom, both in particular cases and in general policy. After the terms of the agreement had been referred to Rome and the people had accepted and confronted and confirmed the treaty with Hero, the Romans decided not to maintain their whole army on the island but to keep only two legions there. They calculated that with the king on their side, the size of their commitment had decreased and everything? also that in this way their troops could be better supplied than before. The Carthaginians on the other hand when they understood that Hero had become their enemy and that the Romans were becoming more and more deeply involved in Sicily, concluded that their own numbers must be reinforced if they were to be strong enough to confront their opponents and maintain control over the Sicilian affairs. Accordingly, they recruited mercenaries from across the sea, many of the, them Ligurians and Celts, and even large numbers of Iberians. And dispatched them all to Sicily. They noted that the Argentum 
possessed the greatest natural advantages for the preparations, and as it was also the most important city in their province, they concentrated their troops and supplies there and decided to use it as a base for war. All right, I, I think that's probably a good place to stop for today. Uh, we got a fair bit of work done in the campaign, and we got through quite a bit of uh, the first part of Polybius' work. So, yeah, that's going to do it for today. Uh, part two will be next. We'll continue reading through the first Punic War, and we'll continue through this campaign as well. I hope you guys are enjoying the uh, little history lesson, I guess. I mean, it's not really... I, I mean, I'm not giving the history lesson Polybius is, but um, a lot of really interesting points that he makes throughout that. A lot of really good stuff. So uh, we won't dwell on that right now. I might maybe briefly talk about it uh, at the beginning of next episode. I want to thank everyone for wa watching and uh, hope to see you for part two. Have a great day. Ragnarok signing out.